Good evening and welcome to the second in a series of uh, adoption education uh, provided by Forever Mount Adoption. And tonight we have a special group with us that are from Life After Placement. And so we're grateful to have them with us and they are a, a group that uh, supports uh, birth mothers uh, throughout their, through their adoption and, and post-adoption. And so we're grateful to have Linnea and her and uh, uh, Hannah and Tina uh, with us uh, tonight. And um, uh, this will be a uh, video presentation uh, that will be up on the website uh, soon. So we're grateful for our studio audience that's here, but we're mostly grateful for those in, in the uh, uh, audience that will be watching this in the future. So I'm gonna turn the time over to Linnea and she can introduce herself in, in the panel. Thanks, Steve. Um, my name is Linnea Krutovich. I'm a bird mother of going on 29 years, reunited going on 18 years, I think. Um, I run a foundation called Life After Placement to support birth mothers after they place because I found with my experience that it's been incredibly difficult to manage just everyday life things and not understanding what those triggers are and how to manage it through other birth mothers. So I figured, why not kind of combine the two? So with that being said, um, I'm going to introduce you. This is Hannah Ballard. She's a birth mother of seven years, am I right? Yep. And Tina Jones, who is 30 years and reunited, can I say? Somewhere in there. Somewhere in there. <laughs> right at 18. Oh, right at 18. Wow. Right at 18. Wow. Right at 18. Wow. Wow. Math, so. so, yeah, so we've got a little you bit. Do that math. I don't want to. Thank you. Yeah. So, with that being said, um, we have some questions that we've kind of come up with, but we kind of want to make this like our own little girl talk because we do a lot of that with of our support groups. So with that being said, um, I'm going to have you, Tina, kind of get a little bit about your story and if it was private and just just kind of nutshell it and tell me what you're going to type it. Um, okay, so my name's Tina Jones and my placement was in 1988. <laughs> so um, adoption was different then. Um, somewhere in there when I was deciding um, what my choice was going to be and um, looking at all of my options, I made the decision that I wanted to handpick the family that he went to. So I went through an agency and there was a support person from the agency in my local area at the time. So, um, and we had support groups for girls that were um, pregnant and deciding um, Everybody in the group decided something different, but I um, got, you know, packets or whatever from the agency of potential families to place with and went through those and then handpicked one um, and chose them for my family to place my son through. So, yeah, that was 30 years ago, almost 31 years ago. Isn't that crazy? Time flies well. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So... With me, I was working, I had my own, I had, my, I had two jobs, one that I worked most of the time, and I um, was able, I was capable, I guess, of parenting, I just uh, knew that he deserved better, and so I contacted LES Family Services on my own, and I went up there and said, I want to, I need help deciding, and I want to talk to someone, so then I spoke with a counselor. And they're like, well, what do you want? I'm like, well, I'm, I can't be a parent right now, but I want him to have a family. And so from that point on, I had made decisions. I looked through a book. They, at least Family Services, gave me a book. A lot of the girls I knew who were also pregnant who were in our group at Elias Family Services had chosen adoption, and they had found their couples online. Um, and it just worked out really well as far as like the process of how the adoption went and the it just it was just very smooth. Everything went smoothly. So I like your story because you story. Um, <laughs> mine was 
was based on a date rate. Um, I think it's incredibly important for people to know that because it people have a, a perception yeah, of who we are as, as being birth mothers, like you're, we're adulterers or sluts or, you know. The big A on the... Right, the scarlet letter. letter. And so mine wasn't based on a choice that I made. Um, so it was kind of a forced like, surprise on me. And I did try to go through the agency and I did try to go through um, LBS Family Services because it was in Utah and it was incredibly <laughs> difficult because at that time they had great big binders that were just these legal binders and, and photo albums and they just had all these pictures. And adoption wasn't an open adoption. And I remember asking, hey, can I have contact with the adopted <laughs> family? Can I keep in touch? And they basically said, yeah. <laughs> so um, it, it was a long, hard decision. And it was through a friend of a friend through work that actually contacted me and said, hey, I've got this great adoptive family. And I kind of ended up with their profile and dropped their picture and saw it and just knew right off the bat that they were meant for the couple. So it, it was a private adoption and it was done locally. So there wasn't anything, you know, I guess specific. I didn't have a lot of information. I did my own information. So, so hopefully that will kind of set the stage. So part of what we're trying to do is we wanted to honor birth mothers because Mother's Day was this, this month and we had a great Mother's Day celebration and um, what people don't understand is how we want to be honored or how we'd like to be honored and for some reason that's a really awkward thing for a lot of people to ask us which I think is kind of funny but it's, it's really weird. funny. I think it's just because they don't understand or like they don't it's not something that's typically, typically talked about and so you never know what to ask or even talk I about. I think they're afraid. Yes, that's a nice yeah, way of putting it. I think it's, it's, I think it's, like, it's <laughs> great. We don't want to feeling the yeah. things. Like, Let's get closer so we can yeah. share this conversation. I just remember when, when I was pregnant, everybody had lots of advice and wanted to talk, talk, talk about everything. And then there was this silence after I placed. And like all the support went away because you know the agency had support for me beforehand, but there wasn't any support after. Yeah. And then I wanted to talk about it afterwards. But yes. there wasn't anybody to listen. And I would share pictures and tell stories, and I would just get this blank. People would be so scared. They would be so scared. Yeah, they get this blank face, so like this like deer in headlights, like, oh my gosh, what do I even say? How right. do I even respond? And I remember just being okay. really open about it to a point to where probably after Jordan, when my son was about a year old, when I was just like, I can't do this anymore. It's too painful to even talk about it because the silence on the other end and the lack of understanding and the lack, it, it was just too painful. Yes. And so I chose to just not talk about it ever. I feel like <laughs> ever, ever. I until know. 30 years down the road. No, until, was 18. Yeah. It was 18. Yeah, until my kids were, until I was had two other children that I'd raised and, um, I felt like they were old enough to understand and have a conversation with them. So I had a conversation with them and then it went, then I went silent again. Like, but I never publicly said anything to people like I'm a birth mother or, you know, I, my sister silently celebrated with me and every year she would send me a Mother's Day card before I even had my other children. <laughs> but there was no, there was no one to celebrate with me. It was just this silence. So, with that being said, did you have the community a structured communication prior before with your adoption? So, when I told the agency exactly what I wanted, <laughs> I'm pretty demanding. So I knew what I wanted as far as a family, and I told them exactly what it was, and they gave me a couple different options, and then I, I chose one, and I met them in person, and I knew it was them, and then you know, so then. We, I had read a book, which was unusual for the time, it was in the 80s, right? And I don't even know if I can find the book again, but it was called Open Adoption. And so I had read about somebody like being the auntie, the birth mother being the auntie, and I was like, wow, is that even possible? Right. So when I met my family, I asked them about that. And in my mind, I was signing over my rights to parents and giving that to them. So in my mind, it was their choice 
and I ask them, I would love to have better communication, what would you like to do? And so we had an open conversation about it, and they took time to think about it, came back and talked to, to me, and they said, we've decided to leave it open as, as you want for the first year, which was good enough for me. <laughs> and then, um, so that was our agreement. Well, ours was more like organic, I would guess you would put it. As far as like having strict rules set in place, I, like she had put, I kind of, when I send my rights away, they're the parents, so I want them to make the best choice that they feel is best for their son. And it's still four years, like seven, sorry, I'm so four years, seven years later, it's been seven years, seven years later, it's that way. There are times where I'm like, ooh, I really want to ask for more, but then I think about it, I'm like, no, I'm good. I don't need that. And then I really don't. I've never regretted asking them something. There was some uh, recently, this is the first time in seven years, there was a miscommunication. I, my couple, they found out my adoptive son has autism and that he has ADD, ADHD, and a lot of other issues. And in my family history, we only have like ADD and nothing else. And I was in a position where I did not know the birth father's history. And so the first thing I said to them was like, oh, I'm so sorry. But it didn't mean it like, I'm sorry he has autism. It was more like, I'm sorry I didn't give you the information that you needed. So immediately, like, she texted me back. She wasn't mad or anything. She was just like, oh, don't be sorry. He's a blessing. He's amazing. He's made the way he's supposed to be. And I said, oh, I promise that's not what I meant. Because on text, you don't really communicate it. Like 100% straight. So it was just horrible miscommunication. Yeah, and other than that, it's been very smooth. And for me, I always say, I rethink everything that I want to demand. I'm like, okay, well, I want this, but is it for me or is it for him? And I do self care. I do believe that I need to make myself happy as well, but I feel like for me, his happiness is what makes me happy. So I'm like, if his parents want to communicate with me and that's what they think is in his best interest, then that's what I'm going to do. And it's changed over the seven years because I'm married and I have three children and my husband and my children come first. He does not anymore. I made promises before I met my husband and I will keep them, but I want to respect their privacy. It's very important. Ours was, um, I read a lot of books. I went to the library and read every book I could possibly get my hands on. Um, you know, what birth mothers are, and there really wasn't a lot of positive stuff out there. And so it was really depressing. I mean, did you guys kind of go through that process where you were just like, what am I doing? I, yes, and I wasn't ready. I was scared to death of the whole financial responsibility and just the responsibility of being in charge of a human life was a huge responsibility, and I was having a hard time managing my own life how could I manage another life, too? Yes. I, I couldn't even comprehend that. Right. So it was, um, it just seemed like the best choice for the child. Yeah. Not, you know, not even, not even thinking of me. It was like, you should have a stable home and a mom and a dad and a bed to sleep in. And I don't even have that. <laughs> so I think for all of us, I can honestly say with all the birth mothers, and I know you guys talked about birth mothers, too, I think that's what our number one concern is when we choose to place is this is not about us, this is what's in the best yeah. interest of the child. I think it's a matter of how do you move forward and, and what is it that I wanted. So, I mean, for instance, the communication, I just wanted something, anything, anything. I mean, it was like, I'll give blood, I'll do whatever, you're getting my kid, so, you know, I'll take whatever you can get because I knew that bond was going to be there, it was going to be strong. We just agreed to do pictures, like yeah, for the birthday and for Christmas, and a card, and that kind of dwindled out through the years, and it got to the point where I had to be very vocal about it. Like, really, I, I don't want these keychain pictures because <laughs> at that time you couldn't, you know, you could blow it up and it would get pixelated. So, you know, I wanted to have a really good picture of her, and it was always one of those really, you know, oh. These are all the pictures we took. This is the worst one, and that's how it felt like. She just gave me the worst one <laughs> that was going through, and so it, it took me a long time to find a communication that worked for us. Yeah, but because no one talked about it, 
But with that being said, um, the communication, it, did it change over time? I, I mean, I know for you, let's go back to you because yeah, it, your son. over time, the communication, she, so they had an older son and then I placed with them because they could not get pregnant and then they got pregnant like five months after I placed with them and then they had two, they, they had one more after that. So she has two younger brothers. And so I know as a mom now, I don't have time to do normal stuff. So the fact that she even finds, she never gets on social media, so that's not a great problem with us. She loses her phone more than she liked to admit. So she does have her phone like most of the time. So like even when I was in labor, she like didn't answer her phone because she had lost it. So she came on time. But that I never, I think normally people would be offended by that. For me, it's like I know her, she's like, and sometimes she just forgets, and it was it was just easier to accept that and be like, it's not to hurt my feelings. I know it's not, and so she always remembered his birthday, and our birthdays are like five days apart, so she would always remember to text me anything, just the text to acknowledge that that like you said, you just want anything. So the text she she'll send me pictures every now and then, but I feel like just the acknowledgement of like it all. So yours was just more organic. It's so it was, yeah, there's no you guys just get read I've never other. asked her for a picture in the seven years. And she always is like, It's been a while, I've given her a picture and I'll send her one. She just automatically does it. Because I feel like I don't ever want her to think she's not doing enough. Yeah. So she I always get pictures. Like I never so have that it just comes organic. It really does. And there's a mutual respect. I think the respect is key. Like when you have that mutual respect for each other. And you don't have a sense of entitlement both ways. Because I know birth moms, I know lots of birth moms, they can be really entitled and think they deserve the world. It's like, well, you chose this. And then there's the adoptive parent side where it's like, you need to understand there's a loss of this person. It, it's not like they place and then it goes away. It stays with them through their marriages. I have three children. And I felt differently about my adoption. It hasn't gotten harder. It's just the hardness have shifted. So it's not just like, oh, it's going to be great from now on. There will be times where it's hard for different reasons. So, yeah. How about you two? Um, yeah, the communication changed over time. So when I first placed, I wasn't thinking about me and what I might want and what I needed. I was thinking about what my son would need. And because what I read and what we were reading back then in the 80s was all the things that that I read about the adoptees and all the pain and struggle that they went through to never find their mom and how terrible it was and this whole thing. So I was thinking about the adoptees when I made my choice to like, look, I want to be in communication with you. I want you to tell him who I am. I made gifts that I sent home with him from the hospital. And, you know, I sent, I sent him things. And so I sent letters more thinking about him. I wasn't at all prepared or even remotely understood the level of emotion and pain and grief and anguish that I was going to face even the second day leaving the hospital and the years after. I was completely unprepared for that. So she sent me a lot of um, letters, we had phone calls, etc. the first year and then they had even asked that I come to their home that first year, when he, for, around his first birthday, um, and I couldn't do it. Because it was just, it brought up so much grief and so much pain and loss um, that I could not see, and jealousy, rage, right? oh, yeah. <laughs> um, that I could not, and I adore this woman, and I absolutely love her as a human, but I could not see her in the same room with my son and hold it together. It was just not gonna work for me. So I said, no, I'll meet you at a restaurant. And even seeing them at the restaurant, I totally admired the women that can do the open adoption, but I just said, you know, like, I, this is it. I think it was like 10 months. It wasn't even a whole year. Yes. But I just said, I'm gonna have to say goodbye to you guys. I love and adore you, but I need to let go because I can't hold on to these strings anymore and be okay. But can I, can I interject? Is that because there was nothing after for you to go to? Was there There was nothing. There so. was no information. I know now, later, you know, it's been 30 years, 
and I've done a lot of self-healing. I think the biggest amount of loads, I mean, grief comes in waves, right? And um, probably the second biggest wave was when I had my own kids. Uh, yeah. That's like, crazy. to realize, I gave this up. And oh, I, and then there's the whole, I could have done it, and I, you know, things could have been different. There's all of that that goes through your head. And oh my gosh, how different it would have been to have support. And I know I didn't have support. I didn't have support from family or friends or, or yeah, I didn't have anybody to talk to. Yeah. So um, even now being here in Utah and meeting Linnea and what we've known each other for a year now and um, just helping other girls here and being a part of life after placement has really helped me to heal even more. So even though I met my son and he is in my life, and that is like amazing. <laughs> that is amazing in itself. Um, but just having, oh my gosh, having support in what you do for the girls after placement because I was completely clueless and unprepared for the uh, level of emotions. I think with, with mine, it was the same way with yours. I suppressed all those emotions and feelings because, again, you walk away with empty arms. You come out of the hospital with empty arms. No one knows what to say to you. No one wants to really talk to you because it's such an uncomfortable situation and feeling it. And I remember I wept and wept and wept to the point where I think my pillow, my hair, I was sweating to death. I mean, I was saturated. And it was just... I don't even remember the days went by. And then something just kind of clicked and it just shut it off. I suppressed it and I just swallowed it. And for years, I kind of processed it in that regard. And I didn't, whenever I got a picture from her, because we didn't have an open, you know, like the way you yeah. met your son and that, and unlike you, I, I wanted to see her, but I didn't know the reaction. And so I would stalk my male lady just because I knew when the pictures would could come, and thankfully I introduced myself because that was creepy. Um, she she finally knew why I was stalking her and why I was looking for these letters, and they always came late. And, and it was just heart wrenching. And then I would go through the emotions of all that process of again, again, and it was yeah. this constant cycle of okay, so now I got to swallow this giant elephant down because I don't know how to deal with these emotions. So I barely. No one myself. understands. No. Yeah, no one. Yeah. And there's and this huge celebration when you have a baby. Yeah. Yes. Everybody's like, they want to ooh and ah, and they want to celebrate, and they want to see pictures, and they want to hear stories, and all, none of that happened. No. And when I wanted to celebrate, I would just get like, and I'd want to share pictures. People would just have this blank stare, like they didn't know what to do with me. <laughs> so then it was like, well, I just made you terribly uncomfortable, so I guess I'll shut up now. Yeah. The deer in the headlights look. That's, yeah. that's our favorite conversation. So I didn't have any, that was the only limited contact I had, so you got to see your son. So when I had him in the hospital, I think, like, the start of the communication being so all, I think this is where it kind of started. When I, so in the hospital, they had, like, a, ch a church in the hospital, and they were very respectful. They didn't even come visit. They visited me for a little bit, and then I got, like, the whole day with him. And they had a photographer when I gave birth in the room so that I could have pictures, which, let me tell you, that is the best idea ever. I never had pictures of my own kids. Like, I never did that, but because I had that, and they took, like, I think I have an album about this thick, and it's like 600 photos, and and they gave me every single one, not, not the cute edited one, like every single picture they took, and they were tasteful and beautiful, so there's nothing gross on there, but it was... And I just understood where they stood as far as their respect for me. They knew how important this was to me. Um, the first, like, communication that was, like, the best was just, like, the first year. Because they would, they wouldn't even call me. They would just stop by, not with the, not with my son, just by themselves and just to give me a hug or to say, or drop a little gift off to know that they're thinking of me. For, like, Thanksgiving. Wow. Who does that? And, like, <laughs> your parents. <laughs> like, they <laughs> dropped off, like, baking supplies. Like, I wanted to... I didn't think I want some of that. <laughs> and they were just so, they, they, they constantly reassure me that I'm thought of. And because I'm so reassured, I never ask. Because I always feel like I'm appreciated. I'm loved. They showed up at Birth Mother's Day oh this gosh. last, this last, this month, and they didn't even tell me they were going to show up in there. They just showed up and they're like, 
they gave me a hug and I like cried. I was like, oh, you guys came, that's so sweet. I didn't even think about it. Um, and you got pictures. And I got pictures. It, it was just the respect. If you, you can never, I feel like unless a birth mom tells you like step back, you can never give them too much. Like I feel like, and they always respected just doing things for me and not always having my adoptive son involved because they knew that they could be sensitive. That's a hard thing. So they would do it by themselves. They would take me and my husband out to dinner with just them. And I feel like I like the couple more than I like my adoptive son. <laughs> it's okay. So I'm like, they're super cool. And they're, I think that respect and communication has made it last. I mean, we're only seven years in. Things can change when he's like a teenager and you guys have more experience in that area. But I feel like it's been so consistent. I don't see it going back. Unless he goes crazy. <laughs> so I feel like it's the best with I, I met them, so I don't think they'll disown you. <laughs> I, I don't think they will. I don't know about my, my son, but I know they would love it. But I think as far as like the honoring us and the communication, if you honor your birth moms, they'll love you. They will, and some you might get a, a birth mom who maybe doesn't worship Kate very well, but eventually she will. Eventually. Having the stories from the mom telling it's like I hang on every word yeah. when I have conversations with her like we had a few conversations that first year and then um, when he turned 18 like I sent her a letter and sent my son a letter and said here's my information call me and she'll call you know she called me like right after she got that letter and we talked and talked and talked and it's like and I hang on her every word I want to hear the stories I want to know what he did and when he skinned his knee and did he cry and how do you do here? And it was like just to hear her tell the stories was just filled my heart. I know yes, that. That's what I had. I had phone conversations that I was I didn't want to hang up. I, I yeah. really didn't want to hang up because that was like my lifeline of oh, she's doing great. She's doing great. And she would tell me some of the stupidest things, but they were so they meant a lot. They to meant you. so much to me. Like she tried to run away from home and. The adoptive mother's explaining it. She got a garbage bag. She shoved all her stuffed animals in it, and it was so full and so heavy. She was dragging the bag, and all the animals were falling out because the bag ripped. And I'm just roaring, laughing because, you know, I think anybody else would be like, "Why would she want to run away from home?" And I'm like, "All right, well, what kid doesn't want to run away from home and think they have a better life?" And and it was just funny. I just didn't want to end the conversation because that's all I had. So I did. I, I like the mailbox. I hung up every word so that that kind of communication and love I think was just given and, and I think I can safely say we love our adoptive parents I mean, right from the get-go and there's no way to answer but there yes. was as soon as I met them I just knew I mean instantly yeah. I just knew that it was them and yeah same thing and I want I what I loved is this, the pictures that were not staged like I remember sitting down with my with the mom and, and say um, she was showing me a pile of pictures and, and I'm like, what about this one? Where she's like, oh, he's crying. And go, but that's real life. Yeah. I want the real life stuff. I don't want the staged. Yeah. I don't want the polished over. I don't want the I look good on camera thing. I, I want, want the nitty gritty. I want the yeah. real snotty nosed kid crying because what I want the real life stuff. Where they paint on the walls or take care yeah. of all the all the stories yeah. because that's what kids do and that's just life. So were you able to contact her whenever you wanted to, or was that just kind of a the first year it was back and forth. We con I had her phone number. Yes. And, and then after and then after that first year, I I let that go. I I respected our their choice. Well, I it was about ten when I mean, he was about 10, 11, 10 months old before the year was up. I said I can't do this anymore. And I kind of lost her phone number. But I mean, it makes sense. Because that, that was what you decided because it was what was best for your They like, were They lived far enough away. They lived about three and a half hours yeah. away, so I couldn't stalk them. But if they, <laughs> if they lived in my same town, I would have stalked them. I had that problem. There were years in there, like in the like teenage years, when <laughs> I, I, yeah. So you get the temptation. You lived in the same state, and I knew their phone number, and that was before computers and everything else. So you could call the operator, and there was so many times <coughs> that I just wanted to just drive by, just do that drive yeah. by. Oh, I, I used to my. I did that all the time. Did you dream about it? No, I've done it. I, <laughs> no, but 
Yes, I know. I've been talking about it. My sister afterwards would be like, I know, I'll go steal him away and run away to Mexico. And my sister would be like, really? You don't think they would find you? That you go there. I think those are the thoughts that I think that people don't understand is is that everybody has regrets. We all have skeletons in our yeah. closet. So it's for me, it's almost stupid when people ask, well, do you regret it? And I'm like, well, no. Do you have regrets? I mean, I made the choice because it was the best choice for me. You and have to not regret it. I mean, the, yes, the thoughts come up and you question, but you have to you go, go back the to the process. Yeah. Go back you through go the process. If I made the choice for these reasons and it was solid at the moment. I call it and what you, if wishing. And it's you not go, productive. You go to that dark place of. It's not okay, worth it. Gonna, yes, it's too painful. We're gonna go and meet at the school. <laughs> you're gonna grab the kid. You're gonna grab the van. Okay, I've never had that. <laughs> but you did stalk him. Oh, I okay. I didn't talk him because they invited me to their home. But I wanted to show my family that because I didn't tell my extended family until like I was married. So like, I said this really did happen, and this is where they live, and like, and. It was weird just because they were there and they were getting out of their car and they saw me and they're like, hey, come in. So you didn't <laughs> tell your family you were pregnant. So I didn't tell. So my mom, my mom and dad, well, my stepmom and my stepdad knew, but my siblings didn't know. And so wow. I wanted them to realize that. They, so my older sister had also placed and my younger sister had had a baby and decided to keep and she was, our sons are a month apart. So we were pregnant at the same time and she chose to keep and I chose to place. Uh, so... We're 15 months apart in age, me and my sister, and we were living together in the apartment when we got pregnant. And so I kept it from her because she, I, I tried, I went away, I went like to different areas. I went to like San Francisco and like Oregon and, and Florida. She didn't know it all. The sister you lived with. Yeah. The sister, she didn't, she didn't know, know until I wow. was like, when I had, so she knew when I gave birth and because she was pregnant, she was going to be giving birth soon, and I, I had to come back to give birth to Boise, and so she was gone while I was in Boise. So we weren't never in with each other. Wow. Um, so for me, there was a lot of triggers after placement. For me, it was my sister having her son and getting to experience. But I also got to see all the hardships because she was a single mom. So I'm like, I don't want to deal with that. And for me, I like, I would like to call it my thesis statement for why I placed. <laughs> And it was like, I had parents who loved me, but did not love each other. And I think for me, I wanted him to have parents who not only loved him, but loved each other. And that makes a huge difference in the home. Because I've seen, I have family who've never been divorced, who were happily married. I know what that dynamic, dynamic is. So I wanted him to have that. Because I don't even know what that's like. And I don't want to have to fight a, a, a guy who I don't even care about at all, zero feelings whatsoever. I wanted him to have his best chance. And when it comes to, I know this is all about honoring our birth moms, but I feel like when adoptive couples kind of reach in and they kind of understand why we place, and they, and I know most couples have either had, can't get pregnant or have horrible, extremely horrible miscarriages, losses, that we could never even understand. And I think for me and my adoptive mom, I feel like we connect very closely on that. We understand the loss. Her loss is way different than mine. But I think she, because she's experienced loss, we have such a good bond because of that. And I have a really huge respect for her. And she, I mean, she had twin stillborns. She had two stillborns before that. She had, so the weekend before I asked her to be my adoptive couple, she had had her twins like the month prior, and I did not know that until like my mom told me, I was like, oh, that's some deep stuff. And I never doubted my entire, before I placed, like the, the whole nine months, I was totally on board. I knew what my sister did, she was forced, my older sister who placed, and then my younger sister was keeping, and I'm like, so I get both spectrums, and I'm doing this as a choice, and I'm prepared. I was, I had a lot of prayer involved, <laughs> lots of praying, and, I can tell you that it's it, just the mutual respect and how they've honored me really has made the adoption what it is. But there has to be a mutual respect. Did you have any obstacles 
the communication besides the one you just told us about with the misunderstanding of the text? Yes, I think just the fact that they don't ever respond to like phones <laughs> or social media. <laughs> so like, this is where it's cool. They're building a house and so they show me where they're building their house, like where they're gonna live forever. They want me to come over with my husband and my kids. I'm the one that's actually holding back. They're the ones who just want us to come over all the time, have sleepovers and stuff I'm like, oh, I'm good. But they, I think the, the fact that they're so, they're overdoing it makes me feel better. It's like, I never have to worry about asking or like anything. I feel like I'm so confident in our adoption that I never have worries. I don't have that fear. There's things I fear about my adoptive son because we know personality-wise we're very different. Um, he's autistic and has all these things, and the bonding, I think, that's the hardest part, I think, of my adoption. What about part. your team? Did you have any obstacles as far as communication goes, or was that kind of nicked once you met him? It was just kind of, because I know you have a really good reunion. With like George, with, George, with yes. my son? Well, the adopted family. With the family? Yeah. Um, so communication after, after he was 18? Or the was there any one? obstacles? Like, did you have any obstacles, or was it well, there not wasn't until really any communication? It was all through the agency, and it was very minimal until he was 18, and then um, I, um, and then after that, her and I haven't had much communication, and it makes me sad. I would like to have more communication, um, and I, I don't know. I think there's a, a thing on her end of wanting to be the perfect mom and show me this perfect little thing and not, but I don't really care, she's human. And I know that um, after I um, had my son, like we met, it was, he's, um, he'll be 31 in July, so his birthday's in July, it was August, first around the 1st of August or so that I met him, um, right after he was 18, and um, somewhere in there, then I had him come out for a Christmas vacation to meet my kids. Um, and at some point, I sent her a letter that was like, here, I've spent days with this young man who's now my friend. Yes, he's my birth son, but he's not my son. Because he was, you know, she's mom. I'm yes. the friend. So um, I wrote him, a, I wrote her a letter and was like, thank you for raising such a well-balanced, emotionally respectful, just an amazing human. I will take credit for his looks and his intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> that's his genes and that's on me. Can we, just, yeah. can we mold all of our stories that right. together and make a good stuff out of it? Yeah. Mine wasn't, you know what's funny is, is you guys know my story that most people don't, and I'm kind of going through these questions through our conversation, so if anyone has any specific questions, but you know, our obstacles were, for me, was that she became a teenager. And yeah, so, that's what I'm afraid of. Yeah, and so they they basically just said they finally gave up. She just became really just hard. a really difficult teenager, and they they said, "Here, take her. We're just we're done." And I remember talking to them on the phone, just saying, "Look, she's a teenager. I did some of this stuff." I remember walking them through, you know, what I used to do in hopes that that would like encourage them to. You know, because I it felt like it was somehow my fault that she was this teenager, even though the reality was she is who she is, you know, and she makes her own choices and decisions, and they have to set boundaries as parents. And it was really weird to find that boundary of where do they want me to be, because they were always asking me or telling me what was going on, so it was really awkward to find a boundary. Yes. Mine was just yes. silence. <laughs> there was just <laughs> silence from about ten. He was about nine or ten the last time I got a letter and pictures. Yeah. And then I just had silence. I just wanted to know that everybody was alive. Right. Yeah. Crying out loud, right. sent me something, yeah. smoke signals, anything. I was so that was hard. But um, and then somewhere in there, um, I became a single parent, which was I can relate to you, like. The reason why I chose to place my son was I didn't want to do the single parent thing. Yeah. I saw how hard it was. I saw other friends of mine who were doing the single parent thing. Yeah. Oh my goodness, just the financial strain and the strain on the family. I didn't want that for him or for me. So, and then now here all of a sudden I was the single parent with two kids 
And then that hit me of, I could have done this before. I could have died. There's a what ish pull. I know. So yeah. then that pull hit me again. It's like the whole grief, it's like you get over it, and then it's like it comes back in waves at yeah. the worst times. So, and then there was just silence. So there was like eight. So the boundaries, least. you didn't have like, you didn't have, you didn't have to be around him during his like, real teenagers. Just, no, because they were, well, yeah. they were far away, and yeah. their only communication was snail mail, so, you know, it was like in printed pictures, which was very few. Did you have any boundaries, like, even if he's 18 when you, like, reunited with him, but, like, did you have to set boundaries for him at all? <laughs> did I have to set boundaries for him at all? <laughs> yeah. Now? I think you so, wanted okay. more. I, can I have, had, like, um, so, you know, there's all these, like, I, right before he was 18, I, I connected with the woman who was my advisor or counselor or whatever yeah. through the agency. She's an adoptive parent, and she kept telling me, that Tina, it's not going to go the way you think. And I'm like, yeah, you are so wrong, honey, because it will. Because <laughs> this is my boy. He's going to be. So I just knew that he was going to want to find me, and I knew that, anyway, I just, um, so the one, I when I honored our decision to go through the agency, and I called the agency first and said, hey, he's going to be 18, like, in, the, you know, two weeks, and he's going to call you. And they're like, yeah, no, and I'm like, no, and he's going to call you. <laughs> and I'm like, so I need to send a letter, and here's how it's going to go down. I want to have a room set aside so that we can meet together in, and it was like, um, I had called them that middle of the week, the agency, and they're, yeah, like, whatever. And sure enough, my son called me on, like, a Friday night, like, after the agency's closed, right? Like, at 6 or 7 at night, and he's, I can hear the road noise, and he's like, I'm on my way, <laughs> and I'm going to meet you. Where can we meet? And I'm like, um, okay, so we had to kind of meet in the middle because we were about six hours away. So we chose to meet in the middle in, in um, Portland is where I'm from, Oregon. So um, we met, we were going to meet there. But as I called the agency and left a message on their answering machine, well, it's going down. <laughs> I'm like, you guys had better be ready bright and early Monday morning, and those doors had better be open because I'm going to be standing there. And I told, you know, so... Um, yeah, that's how it how it's went down. But as far as I left communication up to him. Yes. Yeah. Like it was his choice until honestly, um, it you know, so I let him do the whatever's like call me or instigate the meetings. Um, I would ask, you know, hey, do you want to come meet my kids for the holiday, you know, Christmas break, that kind of a thing. And um it really was he's 31, like I said. It was yeah. probably only just two, three years ago that I finally picked up the phone and I said, I'm going to do what I want. <laughs> and I'm going to do this for me. And I'm going to pick up the phone and call him and tell him the words. I love you. Because I have to say it for me. And because, you know, it's like he hadn't said it. Even though we had all those conversations about why I chose what I chose and and it was all, but it was like, I had to do this for me. So he's older, and I'm in a lot different place of, it's no longer just his choice. <laughs> he's been in my life for years now, and we have an ongoing relationship, and I call him when I choose. Yeah. <laughs> and I ask him to come visit me, because yeah. I want him to. So, um, you know, he's not 18 or 17 or 16 yes. anymore. We have an adult friendship, and... We hit it off really well. We finish each other's sentences. We, you know, it's like we think alike. And his words are, he always says, Tina, every time I talk to you, I understand myself better. He goes, yeah. I see myself Great. in you. you. Oh, yeah. So um, I'm in a different place of, yes, I call him when I choose, and I ask him, hey, I'm going to come visit you. When will that be OK? <laughs> So one of the questions is, is, is the honesty. I mean, because I know a lot of adoptive parents always want to know this. And, and I know as birth mothers, we, we want to verbally vomit a lot of emotions and feelings. But for me, I, I wanted 
to have that constant honesty and, and it was really difficult since my adoptive parents we had those conversations and of course the teenage years kind of came about and became more and more uh, uh, what do I say and and I remember always having to I call it recap before I say it like I was like preparing them for like the mudslide I guess if that's a great way to say it like I really really love you and I really admire you and and I'm going to say this with all the love of my heart, but go get her tested. Like, you know, yeah. go see a psychologist. I have that go see a counselor. And it and it, sometimes it didn't go very well. Did yeah. it go well with you? It did for me because I knew that the potential birth father had, he had family history of, like, mental disability oh. and mental health and depression and stuff like that and anxiety and so I was like, I wanted to help them, so I constantly, like, nonchalantly give them all this information. Be like, oh, just in case you're wondering, here's all this information. They're like, oh, thank you, that's good to know. And as he got into school, like, elementary school, he, he had problems. Like, he got, he, he couldn't under, he didn't behave very well. And so he was taken out of school, and she's like, he's so smart, I don't understand why all these things are. I'm like, oh, why don't you? Like, I never, like, straight up said, he's autistic but I was like you should probably get him tested just in case and and she would always give me these scenarios and she's like what were you like she would always ask me what were you like in elementary school and just begging for answers in the most nicest way and I would tell her and she'd be like she does look like oh he's not like that <laughs> like it was do hard you, for do her. you think that the honesty you were afraid that the honesty would just like crush her did she not want to She's like painfully nice, so it's like you want to say something <laughs> nice back, and so you're like, so I think we got, we're, now we're at a place where I can be 100% honest, because I'm like, I eventually tried, I contacted the birth dad, and I asked him all these questions, and he didn't want to answer them, and so I was bold, and I called his mother, <laughs> and I, and she's a sweet lady, she's very kind, and she answered all my questions, she was very up forward, and she gave me all this medical history, and I was able to give it to the parents, and they're just like, this has helped us so much. And they were, they knew how hard it was for me, and they were like, thank you as well. I'm like, well, this is for him. This isn't about me. He needs help, and you need help helping him. And I don't know who else to ask, so I did what I could. And the boundaries, I feel like <laughs> we're we're getting to the point where we might have to start making some of those boundaries because um, they. They make my husband sometimes a little uncomfortable, and so I don't want it to like interfere with them, my family now. So learning to make those, but they're still they're just very they know how to honor us, honor me as a group mom. It's just it's it's a blessing, and I wish I could like write down everything. So like every time an adoptive couple like <laughs> wants, wants to adopt, and they're like, how can we help our group mom? Be like, I should just give them this paper. Be like, here. Um, <laughs> And I know that's mainly why we're here today, is just to figure out how adoptive parents can honor birth right. moms. And I think the education is huge, knowing because emotionally, there's nothing, nothing's written down about all the emotions that we go through, and it's always connected to postpartum depression. But I feel like there should be another one next to it that's almost identical, but has a lot more things to it, because um, when, even when you have a child in postpartum, or when you suffer a baby, who's died, it's like, that baby, you will no longer see that baby anymore. And that's devastating, horrible. And then adoption is like, that baby still exists. It's still running around and you'll see it one day. Or I've been to, I went to the grocery store, it was like six months after I placed. They were there because they lived in the neighborhood and I was like, I ran to the bathroom and I like cried because I was like not mentally prepared to see them right. again. They didn't see me, but I saw them. And I, like, <laughs> I was like, oh, why did I just cry? It was just, you don't understand, like with postpartum, there'll be there's the commercials of holding the bags of potatoes and they're crying because they hear a huge there's too many potatoes. <laughs> and it's the same, like there's so many emotional things and they hit you at the weirdest times. When I had my son, he was in the NICU and I remember looking at him because I didn't get to hold him straight away and I just because I didn't hold my adoptive son. My I wanted his mom to hold him first. And I've never regretted that decision, but when I had my Oh, done. I still never got to hold him. I don't know what happened, but something didn't click. There was, I was just staring at this child, and I was like, he was in the NICU, and I was, he was an alien to me. I was like, I don't know what I'm supposed to feel. Didn't know it was postpartum depression. So I'm like, 
holding this kid, I'm like, I feel like I'm holding a doll. Like, it's not, nothing's happening. It's not real. And no one really had taught, they, I thought postpartum depression was kind of like a, a myth yeah. until I had it. Yeah. And I feel like as far as honoring me, they were super gentle about that. Right. And they celebrated me with my own children. So when I had my kids, they were so excited. And it was just great. Yeah. That was a really big deal, honoring. So when I met my son and we talked through everything, like he just ate up every word that I told him. And I was like, my question to him was, didn't your parents tell you about me? Because I had communicated, this is who I am and this is why I made my choice. I made him, I hand knit him blankets. I had sent him birthday presents. I sent gifts with him and stuff with him because this is who I am. This is why I choose this. And he was like, no, I never got any of that. Right? Yeah, that was a huge crushing blow to that's me. Hard. And then he said he went, he never talked to his mom about it, but he went home and dug through the garage and dug through boxes and searched and he never found anything. So it was this huge gap for him. I'm like, he's like, no, I went through the teenage years and my friends and I would say, we're going to find her wherever she is. Like, he, his parents are really tall, and he's not, and he's got smaller hands, and they're just bigger people. And he just remembers feeling like, I'm the alien here, and I'm different than everybody, and, you know, why am I so different? But they didn't, as adoptive parents, they didn't tell him about me or why I chose, and that so when he's 18, he can come find me if he chooses. None of that was discussed, which was <laughs> devastating to me because that was what I thought our agreement was. I thought we had this agreement right. that he was going to know all about me. Yeah. And even to him, you know, he, his comment was, well, you made it too easy for me to find you. <laughs> it's like, it was supposed to be an adventure. <laughs> he's like, when I was 13 and 14, my friends and I would would dream up of getting in our car and driving across the United States for days searching. He goes, you just handed me a letter. Like, that was too easy. Well, you know, that's funny because my my adoption story is is far from a pleasant story. The first 10 years were, were really beautiful. Then after that, it just hit into a snowball and then into the ocean, and I don't know what happened to it. But it, it became really bad actually because the communication I don't think they wanted to understand her and I think they were going through the blame game of as a parent because we all do it as parents we think oh our kid's doing something wrong what did I do wrong but I think the fact that she was adopted they made it easier almost right it was like well that must be from your birth parents that must be from your birth mom that must never talk bad about your and so my experience with the communication was they, they weren't honest with her from the very beginning. And it, it created, like you did, I read in all the books with what it, the adoptees were, you know, how they felt and what they were going through. And I would be really frustrated because no matter what I would say to them, they always had an answer to come back with of an excuse as to why they didn't do something. And I remember feeling frustrated because I knew what was going to happen. They just were in denial, and there's nothing you can do about it because you can't call them up and say, hey, you're being a dumb you know, parent today. I didn't want to discourage them in any way, shape, or form. I just wanted them to know this is going to happen. Like Genetics is there. There's nature, and there's nurture, and nature's coming into play. And they didn't honor me from the very beginning. So very long story short, they had, when she started the elementary school, they had talked to friends, and they had, you know, because kids talk. And they oh, I have a stepdad, I have a stepmom, and, and that, you know, she wanted to know what was going on, so she went and asked her parents, you know, well, if I'm adopted, because she knew she was adopted, she says, where's my other parents? And they didn't know how to deal with it, because they did go through an agency. I don't think they had any of the education. And that's where I think it's incredibly important with communication and honesty. And instead of telling her the truth, they just, I think it just felt more like it just kind of blurted it out of, well, your mother, your birth mother and I were married and she abandoned you and then I remarried to your mom now and she adopted you. And 
for the longest time, I remember the adopted mother just saying, she just doesn't respect me. And I didn't know this until about seven years ago. So 28 years, take seven years away from that, someone did that. But it was, it was kind of like they, they, they kind of screwed themselves over, I guess, as far as having her respect her, her adopted mother. And she adores her, her adopted father because she had this idealistic idea of he saved her. He yeah. saved her somehow. And like, and then when she met me, she had these unrealistic ideas of, in her mind, I had a horse ranch, apparently. I don't remember having one, but apparently I had a horse ranch. And now all of a sudden I want to go ask my son, what did your parents actually tell you? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think he and I have had that conversation. I think it was the movie, they called it the movie star complex, where they, they start thinking, well, my, my adoptive parents are these famous people, and they're just waiting to come find me. And I mm -hmm. saw that within her. Apparently, mine wasn't a movie star. It was just apparently a horse ranch. Kids will make up stuff in their minds, and they, you know, even now with early childhood development, and everything they say, even in a divorce, a bad divorce, it's always best for the kids to know who their biological father is, and it's always good for them to have a relationship with them. Yeah. I think it's the same thing with adoption. Oh, totally. Open adoption is a beautiful thing, and I think kids need to deserve to and need to know for their own mental health. They need to know who their biological parents were and, you know, regardless of maybe what the cho why they made their choice yeah. and choose whether, you know, at some point. But I think people need to understand that there's no such thing as closed adoption anymore with DNA testing and oh. all those other things. And so even if you're like, well, we can really keep this a secret, like unless that person goes off grid and like, <laughs> lives in the boonies. If they could probably find a relative, may not be the their, their birth mom, right. but it's it's just really hard to like get that education out there because it's not really talked about. So here's here's the question that that I'm going to ask you because I, I know I know how you guys feel and I know how I feel, but for the audience and the people that are listening to this, how would you think that would be the best way to give sensitive information to the adoptive parents? I know for me it was like you did. I would kind of like try to amp them up in some way, shape, or form, like soften their heart like a little bit and say, Well, I talk Gee. really good I say good things and then I'm like, so there's a downside to this and I present it. So I'd be like, Oh, the birth father birth father, sorry, is really good at soccer, he's a really good athlete, super smart, worked for the Obama campaign. And he has autism. And then it's like, here you go. So you can make so positive so and delivery negative. is key and making sure <laughs> again you want to respect them. You don't want to just I feel like as parents you were prepared for a lot of things. And so I feel like they probably knew something was up. So I don't think it was a complete shock. So I feel like I was just like the icing on the cake, like, oh you already know this stuff, but here's more for you to have. I feel like it helped them a little bit. And I'm sorry, I got the Obama campaign in my head, so. So, I mean, there was like, some just, I don't know, I'm still early on in my adoption, and I am very well aware of that, and I know things could go south, but they can also keep going really well, and I feel like they will. I think as far as the communication and, like, them honoring me, I feel like it depends on your birth mom, obviously, and I think, like you said, you didn't want to be around your son and the mom because it's just too hard for you, right? So I feel like we can't just say one thing and make it like fact. I think it depends on your birth mom and her situation and why she's placing and you just gotta be sensitive to that. I think that's the best way you can honor her. And you may think, oh, I'm overthinking this, but you you won't be. You'll be saying, okay, well, I love her. We want the best for her. What is best for her too? And don't make us an afterthought because we can tell. <laughs> so that's, I've never had that happen, but I know so many, I know enough birth moms to know. I'm one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know when it's been an afterthought. In friendship, it's easy to tell, especially, you just want to feel loved. We want to feel loved. That's like the main thing. We've mm -hmm. lost something, we lost a part of our body, a part of us mm -hmm. that is never going to be out truly ours, and we don't expect it to be. I I think there's just the mutual respect and learning to find a way to make them feel loved, and then you'll get love in return. It's not just us being yeah. loved, you'll be loved back, I promise. I, I, can, I can speak, and I know Tina, you and I can speak from a long-term basis, that with her not 
her, her adoptive parents not honoring me as, as a person and as someone who went through the nine months and everything that goes with giving birth to this child and making this choice, they discredited me to the point where it was it psychologically affected her as a whole. And so when she did come into my life and she met her half-brother and, and my family and what was going on, it was foreign to her. It was incredibly foreign to her. And you could see the psychological frustration in her head. I mean, it was almost like you could see the picture like floating above her head of just all the what is, could have, why, why did they do this, why did they do that. And, and it really, for a, and my husband's here, he can testify, it really messed her up psychologically for several years. And honestly, I don't know if she'll ever recoup from that. I think it scarred her literally for life. And I can see the ripple effect that it has on her and her kids now. And, and it's, it's, it's really difficult to watch as, as a birth mother and as a parent to watch my son when we talked about it from day one and it's just kind of second nature to talk about it versus my daughter who was lied to about who I was and who I am. And I, I wasn't the adulteress. I wasn't a drug addict. I wasn't all these things, this uneducated person. And so what she, what she did was she mimicked what their perception of me was. So she actually became the drug addict. She actually became, you know, all these things that her parents betrayed me to become. And it's almost like they set the stage for her to be a specific person based on what they're, by running me in the dirt, somehow made them look better. But she absorbed all that because she's who I am. And when she met me, there was no, like you said, you have your son, you just like right off the bat, you could finish each other's sentence. My daughter and I look identical, and there was this disconnect of, I don't get it. I don't, I don't get it. And it was hard for me because I wanted to say, okay, well, um, we got to go get bras because this isn't working, and it's hereditary, you know? And her mother didn't know how to deal with that. Does that make sense? And, and how to do the makeup, and what was hereditary and what wasn't. Dyslexia runs in her family. She has dyslexia, and so she was really angry about it. She didn't understand her body and why she looked the way she did. So, I mean, it's just honesty. I, if I can do anything, honesty is incredibly important. Um, with that being said, so we, we've always, we went through a lot of these questions pretty easily without having to go into it. Um, sense of information to the adoptive family and the child and vice versa. I think we pretty much wanted that one. Um, social media. I think social media is great, but it has a double-edged sword. It sure does. So, I mean, my son is, my son's just not on social media. He's in a corporate job, and he was on social media for a little moment in time, but he's chosen not to, but I see his parents on social media, and that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> All I have to say about that. Do you guys, do you FaceTime, though? I mean, do you? No, like, I don't have a relationship with his mother. And no, I mean, like, your, your son and you, but yeah, you just we see video his... conference. Okay. Armed call. Yeah, we do. And Hannah, I don't mean to write on you, but your adopted parents were having phone. So. Well, they have like an Instagram. I never got, I actually didn't have, they had Instagram before I did it, which is weird. <laughs> like, I never had Instagram until they were like, hey, do you have Instagram? I'm like, I do now. And so I created one. And they post like twice a year. <laughs> so they like, I get more from texting. But I think the social media, I feel like, can be a huge tool, but. When you're posting, I have friends whose adoptive couples have social media, and one of them in particular is like, oh, I didn't know he lost a tooth, and they posted it for the world to see before posting it to their birth mom, and that hurt her. And I'm like, you know, she's probably just wanting to share it with everybody, and you're part of that. Right. Like, you want it per private, I don't know. Some might want it private, but communicating that, like, we want to share this page. We have a, actually an adoptive mom, who made a private page for her birth mom so that the, everything they share is on that private page so that you can, so no one else can see it, you can share it, and it's right. with people who are involved. So it could even be the birth dad or like close family members so that like it's private, but you can still share stuff. I think we had the stone age. <laughs> I think we did too. I just, it's the Pony just, Express was. I think it's just weird. I know my son was on social media like when he's under 18. Like that was 
help us back when like MySpace. Oh yeah, that was <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we just aged ourselves. Oh yeah. So yeah. well, that was he was back there, and so and he's now is he's in corporate America, and he got into corporate America like pretty young. So he kind of stepped off. Well, he totally stepped off of social media. Yeah. So, but it's weird to have him like my family all of a sudden friend him. It's just weird. I don't know. It's a huge adjustment. It yeah. is. I have a relationship with him. Some of my one, you know, my sister has met <clears> him, <throat> and, and yeah. you know, I did have my family meet him. But anyway, it just gets weird. I. It is the most amazing thing in the whole world to have all three of my kids in one room. Yeah. It, it is just, and to have them all get along and talk and communicate and like. <clears throat> The few years that we did that was just amazing. So now that they're older, it's hard to get them all together. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I think because I'm looking through these questions, it's kind of funny. I think we nailed all of these questions within our, our just our conversations, conversations in general. general. So it, it in some of all of this, I think for the most part, and you guys jump in when you want to. I think in some basically, as far as communication go, is always be honest. Yeah. Always be honest. I yeah. think we've talked about this before that communication is so key to any relationship in general. But social media can be good and bad. I think if you can even agree, even the honesty. Uh, this is what I uh, take from talking with other birth moms. Birth moms can sometimes take things as well as adoptive couples wrong, but that isn't on you, and it's not on them. If you take it wrong, or if they take it wrong, that they need to really think about within themselves like okay did this really hurt my feelings like because there are times where it shouldn't have hurt your feelings i've heard stories from birth moms and like you were so lucky don't even try to complain <laughs> like, you're fine and we try to talk to them talk them through it and be like okay it's not a big deal and same with adoptive couples i have family who are adoptive parents and they're like well they want the email me and they wanted a picture i'm like do you realize that they haven't heard from you in like a year like it's probably a reason why they want a picture. And like, oh yeah, you're probably right. I should probably like there's a lot of that that happens and feelings can get hurt. I just don't get my feelings hurt very easily, but for other people it can be very sensitive. And so you just have to find that balance and if you feel like they are falling back a little bit, maybe their feelings were hurt. You can reach out and be like, Hey, I don't mean to push you or anything, I just want to know how you're doing and I I think that's the hard part. It's like you're dating. Everyone says yeah. that when you are adopting, you are dating your birth mom. You're getting to know them. You're starting forever, to be, forever. <laughs> you never like break up. You're always together. But I feel like it's a relationship, and you may not click personality-wise with your birth mom, and that might be really hard to live with for a very long, long time. But hopefully, you do. I'm hopeful that you do. I think. I think in general, I can honestly say. Communication is obviously key, but I think having the communication of face to face, I mean, seriously, we have social media well, now. That face to face means way more than a you can, Well, you can read their body language. I mean, yes, and they can yes. read your body language. Texting is taking If, if all you're the telling time. a story to them and saying something, you can kind of see they're kind of doing this weird, you know, like comfortable conversation, or vice versa. And, and that changes the demeanor of the conversation. So if it is being hurt, you can look at their face and go, yeah, I need to reword that. That came across a little too aggressive or not enough or whatever it is. Yeah. But I think in some, with what we've also talked about, which is a huge, I think, let me know because I, I think you guys agree with me, is education on yeah. both sides. Yeah. And mostly yeah. from, I think, from birth mothers to adoptive couples. And I think adoptive couples are tend to be so afraid because you get that deer in the headlight look. They don't have to know everything. That's the thing. It's like, I feel like there's this expectation that adoptive parents are supposed to be like, have a PhD and know all these things about birth moms. It's like, you're learning, like, just like we are. It's, you take it day by day, but there's not a whole lot out there, which is why we're trying to change that dynamic and educate as many people as possible. Um, I guess as your kids ask questions, answer them. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, really, <laughs> like, answer them. If you don't know, like, call your birth mom. Yeah, like, tell them about them. Yeah. us and let them know who we are, because the kids deserve to know. It's it, again, it's education. I think the more classes that you take on adoptive couples, asking questions, vice versa, and birth mothers, and, and if you can find, and this is just me, 
But if you can find a birth mother to be really good friends with, friend with friend her and talk to her, ask her questions, because I guarantee you, majority of the birth mothers that I've met out there want to talk to you about it. They want to help educate you because she may not have that great of a relationship. She may not know what to say, or even with the birth fathers. I and mean, you know, there's a lot of that more so. Well, that's been the best the thing day. for me all along the journey was to meet adoptive couples and have conversations with adoptive couples and so that I can hear from their perspective what it is. Or adoptees, like the silence is painful It's so them. painful. It's like you're an alien and you don't, you're not in any category. It's and then like, they get in the middle where they're yeah. afraid, like my son is afraid to upset his mom. And he wants to talk to me, but he's like he's he feels like he's in the middle. He's defying his parents. Right. I know because I will ask him, like, do you think I could call your mom? And like I I would be amazing for me to sit with her and look through pictures and hear stories. And it would just be amazing. And I you know, so I'll ask him and he's like, I don't I don't know if she's quite ready for that. Like one of these days as well. Next time I'm in Oregon, I'm just going to have to call her up and knock on her door or something and go, hi, here I am. So <laughs> That's the great part. After all these years, we have a little bit more gumption of going, I don't care what you think, we're just going to do this. Exactly. Where you're still... I'm still in the sensitive stage, like yeah. where you want to make sure that... Because like, she's a mom, she's tired, I know what that's like, she's tired, I'm tired, we're both tired, and I don't want to make her more tired, so it's like... When her kids, I think her, because her oldest son is in high school, and so he actually goes to school with my siblings. So it's like, I see them all the time. They graduate at the same time as my sister. And oh, so, wow. like, I'm going to go to his graduation. And I already, like, I went to his baptism. Like, I went to a huge milestone, and I know they want me there for them and for my son. And it, it's hard to grasp that because I kind of pictured, like, just getting pictures, that's what I told them. That was the, I guess that was the line I had. And the least amount. The least. Yeah. I was like, I want pictures. Like, mm -hmm. that was the thing. And they always do that. I've never, since the time I placed, I've never had to ask. So. I, think, I think that's the best way to honor. Yeah. Keep, keep your promises. promises. Keep your promises. Keep your promises. Don't that over, don't over don't promise. Don't over promise. Yeah, don't, don't over do promise. That. Don't say something that you know you're not going to keep because you're so desperate. I think that's, that's also key, mm -hmm. is just, just be civil, but just be honest. Mm -hmm. You know, the education, you can't get seriously. There's so much more information out there now. And and there's some good, and there's some bad. But I think for the most part, it's just about education and talking to these birth mothers. But for the most part, anybody else have any questions? Does anyone out to get Austin's Yeah. Um, I have a question, because I raised my kids so they were like four years old when they were taken. And I'm wondering how I could get over because I went 12 years not knowing my boys, not knowing anything about them, and then just recently got told, here's some pictures of them, and now it's like, how do I cope with that? Because I went 12 years knowing that I would never see them again, or any pictures for that matter, and now I'm trying to adjust that I haven't seen them, I never knew what they look like, and it's been very difficult. So getting support for you is really, really important to have somebody to talk to and be a sounding board and just word vomit, just tell the whole story for one. But also learn some tools for yourself on how to um, manage your emotions that come up and how to shift them. Because there, there are, uh, you know, you're in the, the one thing that we have in this world that we can control is us. In circumstances, in life, and past, and forward, and we only have this moment. So in this 10 seconds, and sometimes that's all it is, is that it's only 10 seconds that I can deal with. In this 10 seconds, what do, what do I choose to focus on? So get yourself some help, because truthfully, the more you are emotionally stable and grounded, even from a distance, the more it will impact, positively impact your kids. So that when they do meet you, they will see you as a solid, grounded, loving woman who adores them. Because that's what they want to hear. And and I, Tina and I talk about this all the time, and, and I know we, we 
do this a lot, but one of the most important things also is to understand and ask yourself, am I being bitter or do I want to be better? And and it's okay to be bitter, but you have to understand where's that where's that boundary of how long do I want to be bitter to find better? Because a lot of people stay in that bitter stage and just stay in that, I call it the victim stage, where we just can't, like we're constantly drowning. And instead of reaching out for help and saying it's okay to reach out for help is probably the hardest thing. And then once you get to that point where you get the help and you start asking questions, and again, it's great that you're here because you can meet other birth mothers and you can talk to adoptive couples because that tends to help change the bitterness and you start feeling a little bit better, even if it's for 10 seconds or 24 hours. And it does get better, but it's only because of your efforts. And it, it really is about you and what you want to do for you and supporting you. And just to say that when I met my son, um, and I had the piles and piles of books, uh, of letters, all the letters, all the pictures that I had. Um, and the night before I met him, I, le I, I didn't sleep. I, I got to read all of them and look at them, and really look at them for the first time, knowing that I was going to see him the next day. He didn't care about any of that. He wanted to know, who are you now in this moment? He didn't want to hear the story. Um, he didn't want to hear any of the story, and the story doesn't matter because the story can't be changed. Telling the story doesn't change it. You can't and, undo the past. And I, I tell this to clients. I say, your healing is not found in telling the story. Your healing is, is found in getting out of the story and learning in this 10 seconds, in this moment, who am I? And what do I want to create in my future? Who am I, who do I want to be tomorrow? Your stability is, is probably the most confident thing to do for you as a birth mother, and I can think this for everybody, but as birth mothers, that's part of our struggle is finding our grounding and, mm -hmm. and our happiness. And that's a whole other channel of grief. Yep. Yep. So we'd like to thank everybody that was here, and I hope everybody will stick with us again for the next session of this. And thanks for joining us. Thank you.